it's my mission through this work and through Blissful Parenting to really be that lifeline to parents who are struggling every day with getting their children to behave appropriately, get them to listen, get them to contribute, um, avoid all the conflicts. And every day we just see parents out there that just they, they need that help. And, you know, you can, you can spot a parent very quickly where the toolbox has run dry. There's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of hope in dealing with the child behavior and you can just see the desperation. And so it's my mission through this work and through Blissful Parenting Organization that we will serve a million parents to help them live happier and more fulfilling lives and to really have blissful and incredible relationships with their children, their partner, and themselves. And we really do feel that that's a package deal. And we really just want to be that, that, that caring voice and that lifeline for parents who are really out there struggling. It's not just the kids and it's not, there's so much more to it. And parenting is so much emphasis on the children but there's these other relationships as well, primarily with your partner, the person you had children with, and then yourself. And especially in our organization, we have a lot of moms, especially, who put themselves last. They take care of themselves. It's the very last thing they do. And they tirelessly spend time taking care of everyone else. And so this is a package deal. And we want you to have great relationships with your children, uh, great and powerful and empowering relationship with your partner, and you know, just a really special and fulfilling relationship with yourself. This journey all got started for me when my first child was around five years old, and we were just moving out of that sort of happy toddler stage where you know everything is so special and so sweet, and they're all their firsts and all, all the things that they're learning to do for the very first time. And then as they transition from that toddler age into the five-year-old and then on to teenage years, they develop ways of getting what they want. And sometimes those ways are very positive and sometimes they're not. And I found myself really challenged as a parent, and not only as a parent, but as a human being, really challenged with my own emotional responses. And, you know, I, I would get angry in, in, in places where I didn't really consider myself to be an angry person, but I, was, I found myself getting angry and frustrated and, you know, um, and speaking to my child, who I love very, very much, in a way that, you know, just really felt horrible all in the name of getting them to behave or to teach them, you know, the proper way to do it or to have manners or to listen or to do chores or whatever. And it just didn't make any sense to me after a while that my best, the best thing I could come up with to get them to behave better is to make them feel worse. And it just, it, it felt horrible. And so I knew that that wasn't going to work long term. My wife and I had lots of conversations about it. And so I joined a local support group just to kind of talk with other parents who were going through the same things. And, you know, one thing led to another through that organization. I ended up getting trained as a parenting educator teaching positive behavior management skills and, and then also running that support group for a few years. I now get invited back from this organization to train new support group leaders. So it started off just as this, this problem that I was having with dealing with my five-year-old, who is now a teenager, and we're dealing with all that that encompasses. But I'm so glad that it did start that because it gives me that newfound confidence that, look, even in a stressful situation, I'm going to be able to, you know, to be calm and and, and not to do anything from anger that could potentially make the problem worse. There's a three-step roadmap that we take people through that does a couple of things. Number one is it starts to 
develop our awareness of what's really going on. We don't always, we're not always aware of things that make it worse. And when we're in that, we're trying to see a way to make it better is not always going to be clear. So the first step in that is to really understand from an awareness point of view the three reasons why bad behavior actually happens, what makes it worse, and what we can do about it to get things turned around. Then once we have that awareness, building upon that, we're going to look at the four hidden agendas method for dealing with difficult and disrespectful behavior. And this deals with the idea that there's really only four reasons why children seem to be misbehaving. And we don't need to become masters of thousands of different behavior challenges. We only need to get good at mastering the four reasons why be behavior happens and then to respond appropriately to that. And then so once we really understand those ag hidden agendas, we can move into five simple steps for solving any parenting problem even the ones that seem unsolvable because armed with four hidden agendas, you're going to be able to get to the real reason why the behavior is actually happening. The thing about bad behavior is that it's not really complicated. And sometimes we do make it more complicated than it actually is. And, you know, we need to start to look for, you know, solutions uh, that do not involve using fear to frighten the child into compliance and ultimately becoming afraid of you. And when they become afraid of you, can actually make things worse. So we want to avoid things that are going to make things worse that do not address the need. Um, this is going to help us to move forward without having to yell and bribe or take things away or put them in time outs or threaten their video game time or any of that kind of stuff. And I think a big thing, and this really comes out from the conversations I have with parents at the workshops, and that is worrying about who your child is going to become in the future. And ultimately, what we're doing here is we're shaping new adults. They're going to become adults at some point, and the question is, what kind of adult are they going to be? When we bribe and we yell and we take things away, it's a shortcut. It's a sign that the toolbox is not full and we need to learn some better ways to, to get the behavior turned around. So when we bribe and we yell, it actually does make things worse because it is not addressing the real reason behind the behavior. And when we use those kinds of methods, we're kind of trying to use fear to scare our child into complying with whatever we're asking them to do. If it's to, you know, stop banging on the table or if it's to go clean up their room or stop, get off the video games, whatever it is, um, that's, that's really what happens and that's why it gets worse. So there's three reasons why bad behavior gets worse and so we're going to talk a little bit about that just from an awareness point of view so that we can start to notice when this happens. And when we notice when it happens, we can start to do something about it. And reason number one is that so much of parenting and discipline is done as a reaction in, at a time when we are not calm. So reason number one is that we're dealing with things without taking time to calm ourselves down, calm the situation down, calm the child down. And the reason why behavior and really any type of problem is so difficult to deal with when we're upset is because when we're emotional, when we're angry, when we're having that emotional reaction, something happens in our brain that temporarily disconnects us from being able to deal with emotions and to solve problems creatively. It's the part of the brain known as the prefrontal cortex. And when we're angry, it exposes your fight, flight, or freeze response. And you, in that moment, you're completely incapable of rational thought. And 
And sometimes it's done in the name of being very short on time, and other times it's being done simply because it's inconvenient or the behavior that they're, they're, uh, they're doing is making you feel angry. And so one of the shortcuts we kind of do unconsciously is to use fear to, to get them to comply. And, and of course, anyone who's yelled at their child knows that that never works. It always makes things worse. And so we need to take that time to calm down. And when we do that, we're going to be able to rationally figure out what is really going on and what to do about it. And that leads us to reason number two of why behavior problems just seem to be so ongoing. We do not take the time to understand the real reason. We call it a hidden agenda. Why the behavior is happening. And so this is something that I really, really noticed is that if my child wasn't going to bed, I mean, how many of you have ever noticed that when you ask your children to go to bed, they suddenly have more energy at bedtime than they did all day? And or the, you want them to eat the meal and, and, and you know it's one of their favorites, they've eaten it, you know, a hundred times, but on that particular day, they're refusing to eat or... Uh, or they're, you know, they're going on their fourth hour of video game time today and refusing to get off the computer, whatever that is, it's not the behavior. And this is something that I didn't really understand at first, but I certainly do now, and that is it's not the behavior. And that's, it renders almost every book and every sort of method kind of useless because it's not about the behavior. It's about the reason for the behavior. We call it a hidden agenda. And what a hidden agenda really is, it's an unfulfilled need. It's not about the behavior. It's about a need that your child has. So you've got to figure out what is the need. And there's only four. It's either they need attention or it could be power. They want to feel powerful over their lives. Um, it could be revenge. They feel hurt and they are just lashing out in a way that, that it's kind of an indicator that they're hurting inside and they, they're in need of some, some healing. Or it could be inadequacy. They're just, for whatever reason, physically, emotionally, whatever, not feeling up to the task in that moment, and nothing, you know, no amount of forcing them is going to get them through that. In fact, it would just send them deeper. And so there's four. Now, when we are guessing at how we're going to deal with behavior, you only have a 25% chance of guessing it right. And you do guess it right sometimes, and, and it leaves you, you walk away from that situation going, nailed it, right? And, and, uh, and then the next time that same behavior happens, this time happens for a different reason, your memory says, ah, last time I did this, you do that, and this time, instead of it working, it blows up in your face. Why? Because it's a different hidden agenda. So when we're winging it, we only have a 25% chance of get, guessing it right, but we have a 75% chance of guessing wrong and making the behavior worse. So we need to learn what these hidden agendas are and the correct response to them. The way we came up with the hidden agendas method is really a compilation of everything that I read and experienced in you know, numerous trainings, numerous video programs, numerous workshops, numerous books, um, some of them dating all the way back to the 1800s, uh, and others that, you know, more modern day, but really just taking the best of everything and compiling it together. And so I can't really take credit for inventing the mm -hmm. methods but what I did do and what our team did was put it together in a way that makes it simple to identify what the real reason is and then to kind of laser target towards the correct response that's going to meet that need or that hidden agenda. The third reason why behavior seems to get worse is because we're simply reacting to the behavior rather than preparing proactive solutions that actually prevent it from happening 
in the first place. And so, you know, you've heard the expression, no news is good news. Well, that's not always true when it comes to parenting. So they're not misbehaving in this moment. Therefore, there's nothing for me to do. But it's kind of like a pro athlete. You know, they, they spend their time preparing for the big game. They're practicing. They're learning their skills. They're sharpening their skills. And as parents, we don't often take the time to do that. And so we often get caught by surprise with a behavior challenge that we've never seen before, or we were completely unprepared for dealing with. And so one of the things we can do now, for everyone who just said, I don't have time for that. What if you took the time to do that? And it doesn't have to take a whole lot of time. And I'm sure glad that I did it. And that is to learn some new skills to be proactive, to learn some new life skills, model those for your children and influence them to use those life skills for themselves. See, all, all of this is about problem solving and dealing with emotions that these little people are not used to dealing with. So you take these emotions and you take these needs and you put those together and that equals what seems to be misbehavior, but really it's just an unfulfilled need. And we just need to get really good at redirecting that. And the more you can do to kind of prepare yourself with some tools that can help to redirect that behavior and fulfill the need, not only does the behavior stop in the moments that it's happening, but it starts to prevent it to the point where it doesn't happen at all. So the second part of this is to identify the correct hidden agenda that's the real cause of the bad behavior or what seems to be bad behavior. See, the, and, and what I mean by that is that they, they're not really intending to misbehave. It's just that there's this need that they have or some feelings that they have, and what they're doing right now is the best that they can do or the best thing they could come up with in that moment to fulfill it. And so that there's four. So the first hidden agenda is attention. So when behavior happens for attention, their goal or their hidden agenda or their unfulfilled need is to get your attention. Maybe you've been really busy doing other things or and and there hasn't been a lot of time for connection and to be involved together. And sometimes out of convenience, we just need them to go and play by themselves or, you know, be involved something independently. And what happens is that sort of that attention fuel tank starts to run on empty and they're going to start to try to get your attention. And so if they're craving attention, they're going to get it any way possible, whether it be positive or negative, because it's the unfulfilled need. And only fulfilling that need, giving them some attention, positive or negative, is going to fulfill that need. So, and the second hidden agenda could be power. And so this is, power happens when a child maybe feels like they don't have any control over their, or over their lives. Maybe they haven't been given very many choices and they're just simply tired of being told what to do. They want to feel like they're in control. They want to feel powerful. And so with power, no amount of yelling at them is going to make this go away. In fact, it's only going to make it worse. With power, what we have to do is speak to them in a way that makes them feel powerful, that makes them feel like they're part of the decision-making process and that they're perhaps part of you know, the team, and so that they get to choose. And that's the key word here. And this is what really diffuses power struggles is the power of choice. Giving them a, a, that power of choice will really help to diffuse any situation that is happening because of power. The third one is revenge. And revenge happens when the child feels hurt. Maybe you've wronged them or they feel you've wronged them. Maybe not in your mind, but in their mind, you've wronged them or someone has. Maybe it's a sibling or some other situation and they're hurting inside. 
And the way they're dealing with that is to hurt others the way they feel hurt. And so when we notice that it's revenge or a pattern of revenge or that it's happening because of this, the way to deal with this is to heal the hurt. We have to learn to heal the hurt and to make amends possibly and to rebuild trust, get them feeling good about themselves again. And when they get feeling good about themselves again, then their pattern of revenge will stop. And then the fourth one is inadequacy. And for whatever reason in that moment, they just don't feel up to the task. So I don't know what to do. Even though it may be something you know that they know how to do in that moment, maybe they're tired, maybe they're hungry, could be some other reason for it. Maybe they just forgot or they're worried about something else, but it's showing up as inadequacy because they're not able to move forward. And, you know, in, in these moments, it's like, forget it, I'll do it myself type of thing. And, and when you find yourself doing that, it's probably happening because of inadequacy. And look, you can't yell at them. It's going to send them more deeper into this. Um, you can't give them choice because they won't choose. The only thing you can do here is to start to guide them, break things down into small steps, avoid criticizing, and go to encouragement, go to cheerleader mode, and that's really going to help lift them out of it. So the key to dealing with behavior, we don't need a thousand different solutions for any parenting problem or behavior problem that happens. We really only need to understand these four main reasons. And when we get really good at identifying the reasons and responding in the most appropriate way, the behavior gets better. So I suggest that everybody takes this chart and prints it out, puts it up on their wall. It's going to take some practice. So I highly recommend giving yourself, you know, a 30-day time period to really try this out and to practice it and get good at it. It's like any other skill. We talked about the professional athletes developing their skills. Well, as parents, we have to develop our skills for the big game. And the process is very simple. So we can start to use our own emotions, what's really going on inside of us, as the first clue. It's kind of an emotional compass. Right? And what does a compass do? It helps, you, helps point you north, south, east, or west. Well, in this case, the emotional compass will point us to, is it attention, power, revenge, or inadequacy? And based on what's happening for you and some of the reactions that are happening in the child, you're going to be able to use that information to look it up on the chart, choose the most re appropriate response, and then to respond accordingly based upon the actual hidden agenda or unfulfilled need. So when you're armed with the four hidden agendas method, there's really only five steps that you need to remember to be able to use this tool effectively. And step number one is just simply to take a moment to calm yourself down, calm your child down, calm the situation down. Because until everything calms down, it's only going to get worse. You're going to feel worse. You're going to feel more frustrated. Uh, the child's not even going to listen to you because, you know, they're, they're disconnected. They're triggered as well. And we just need to take five or ten minutes to calm the situation down. And from that calm place where we can start to think rationally again and you can carry on a real conversation, then we can move into step number two, which is to check in to what's really going on inside of you. What are you feeling and experiencing? And you want to take that time to understand what, why the behavior is happening. So you look at your own emotions, you look at your reactions, you look at their reactions, and you want to correctly identify the emotion. Now, with this, you have to start to deal, uh, develop a bit of an emotional vocabulary. It's got to move beyond I'm frustrated or I'm angry. And in the workshops, we often talk about those being umbrella words that actually describe a whole range of different emotions. So what is it specifically? Is it annoyed? Is it 
despair? Is it hopelessness? Is it fear? Is it inadequacy? What is the specific emotion that you're feeling? And have you ever sat beside someone who's having emotion and you start to feel what they're feeling? And that's because we're always radiating emotions. And so when our children are misbehaving or having an emotional response, we're going to start to have that response as well. It's like little radio waves, and we kind of start to feel what everyone around us is feeling. And that's why you want to just simply stop, check into what is it that you are feeling? How is it that you find yourself reacting? And then compare that to how they seem to be feeling and reacting as well. And then you can, once you've identified that, you can move on to step three, which is to look it up on the four hidden agendas chart. You want to choose the response that is fulfilling that secret need or that hidden agenda. And so you want to identify the correct hidden agenda as accurately as possible. Could take some, a little bit of practice, some time, possibly even some training would be worthwhile getting so that you can really prepare yourself and get good at identifying the hidden agenda. And then how to respond appropriately based on the, what the hidden agenda is. And so if it's attention, what can you do that fulfills the need for attention? If it's power, what can you do that fulfills that need for power? If it's revenge, what can you do to help them repair the hurt that is causing the revenge? And if it's inadequacy, what can you do to help build up their confidence and get them to move through it? And so choose the most appropriate response based on the actual hidden agenda. That's step three. Then step number four, is to respond in a way that is both firm in your expectations but and also delivered with kindness. And one of my favorite ways to do this from the Blissful Parenting Program is the I love you and communication template. In the program, we, we have lots of different communication templates. When you learn to use these, they just start to roll off your tongue after a while, but they're super effective, super easy to learn. I love you and we're having chicken to dinner for dinner tonight. And if you would like to help me make dinner tomorrow, maybe we can make something that's more your favorite. I love you and your one hour video game time is up for the day. And so if you don't want this to affect, you know, your next video game time, you'll shut the computer down now, right? Type of thing. I love you and the expectation is that you'll clean up your room and after you do that, we're going to go play in the park for a little while. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is. So it's phrasing whatever your response is with I love you and here's what we're going to do. And so it really kind of gives you that framework to, again, reinforce that you do care. This isn't because you hate them. And at the same time, you're being firm in your expectations. So you want to really be conscious of how this is being delivered. And when we do this, we don't have to yell. We don't have to bribe. We don't have to punish. We don't have to use timeouts. We don't have to take things away. That right there will help not only help the situation in that moment, but it will help to prevent the bad behavior from happening again. And that leads us to step number five. And that is... We need to spend more time teaching and training. And so as parents, we need to learn how to reclaim control over our busy schedule so that we can take more time out for connecting, training, teaching, guiding, and just plain being with. And when we do that, the needs are being proactively met. And when the needs are being proactively met, there is no reason to misbehave to try to get those needs met. And so you're going to find that after a while, the behaviors that you've been experiencing over and over and over and over again simply fade away and things get on to much peace, more peaceful and fulfilling uh, time well spent with family.
A very common question that we get from parents is exactly how do I calm down? How do I calm the situation down? And, you know, what is it? And, you know, in the program, we talk about having a positive time out. And so, so I might say to the child in that moment, look, you know, I want to talk to you about this. I feel very upset right now. Um, I can see that you're upset also. I'm going to go and take 10 minutes for myself right now. And let's just, let's just put this on pause for the moment. And then let's come back and, and, and we're going to address this. And so, look, if they're freaking out, uh, you know, trying to force a hug on them or trying to calm them down by telling them to calm down, it's not going to happen. It's just walk away. Go and take five minutes to yourself. And a very simple exercise that anyone can do is just, you know, go lock yourself in the bedroom or the bathroom, wherever you're going to get privacy for five or ten minutes. Close your eyes. Take three deep breaths in and out, like, and exhale really deeply just to start to calm down. And then just mentally and silently to yourself, start counting backwards from 100. Now, this is going to seem silly the first time you do it. It's like, oh, yeah, whatever. I'm not going to do this. And believe me, it did the first time this was recommended to me. And when I really embraced this, the first time that I actually did it and I counted all the way from 100 down to 1, by the time you get to 1, sometimes you can't even remember what was making you so angry in the first place. And so mission accomplished. You're calm. They've had this time to themselves as well. They're now calm. And now you can address the situation from a rational place. So now that you're armed with the knowledge of the four hidden agendas method and the five steps to solving behavior challenges, you now have this new awareness. And it also takes some time and some practice to, to really get good at it. And it's like any new skill, it's going to feel a little awkward at first, and that's normal. And so you want to give yourself a 30-day commitment to learning this new method, and you also want to get yourself some additional training. And so what I highly recommend is a couple of things. Number one is you want to print out a copy of the behavior chart. You can get one by going to www.blissfulparenting.com slash worksheet. And it's got some instructions there. It's got a copy of the Four Hidden Agendas behavior chart, which is my gift to you. And it's also got a fill in the blanks worksheet. And when you take that worksheet and you register for one of my free Blissful Parenting workshops, and they're happening online all the time, so just go online, register for it, show up for the workshop, and in, during that workshop, we're going to work on some scenarios and actually practice this a little bit so that you can start to use it on a regular basis and where it be, starts to become part of your autopilot. After a while, you don't even have to think about it anymore because it is a new skill that you've developed. And so you want to print out a copy of the chart and the worksheet, and then join in in one of our free Blissful Parenting workshops, get the training and the practice so that you can start to use this whenever behavior happens in your family. Thanks for listening, everybody, and go ahead and get the worksheet and uh, attend the workshop, and, and thank you so much for listening to me today. Mm -hmm.